Burmese pythons, lionfish, the beautiful Japanese climbing fern, what do they have in common? Here in central Florida, they're all invasive species that pose serious threats to our natural environment. In fact, all of Florida's ecosystems, marine, freshwater, and terrestrial, are at risk. Today we'll examine how these species come to Florida and what's being done to reduce the damage. Next on Metro Center Outlook. Hello, I'm Diane Trees. Our first guest today is Dr. Linda Walters, a biology professor at the University of Central Florida. Her research focuses on human impacts in the marine environment. Dr. Walters, welcome to the show. Thank you, it's nice to be here. As a biologist, what does it mean when we talk about invasive species? Invasive species is actually a really um, specific term. A lot of people use it casually, but when you're talking invasive species, you have to have certain criteria, and the criteria are it has to be outside of its native range, where it was found historically, it has to be reproducing in that, that new range, and it has to have some negative impact on either the local um, flora, the local fauna, or um, the ecosystem as a whole. And you have to be able to document that. So it's different. We shouldn't be using the terms exotic, non-native, as interchangeably with invasive species. Exactly. Okay. Invasive species really have to be having a negative impact in a new area. OK, so how does the, the invasive species, a plant or an animal, how does that get transported from its original habitat? The ways that have been documented that are um, uh, pathways for invasives are um, on ships. It can be on the hulls on the outside of the ship. So things like barnacles get transported from port to port. It can be in the ballast water of the ship. And the ballast water is going to be um, what they use to keep the ship from moving from side to side. If they have a lot of cargo, that cargo keeps the ship at the right weight um, distribution. If they don't have cargo, they will fill the ship in whatever port they're in with the water from that port. And then when they don't need it anymore, they just dump it out in the next port. And anything that was in that water, there's a good chance a lot of it survived from port to port. From place to place. Other ways um, that are human um, ways of uh, human pathways, we have things like the aquarium trade. It's huge, and it's a way that we really can do better at not um, dispersing invasive species. And we have such an internet openness with things. Back to the ship ballast, are there any regulations, restrictions? And you know, we're talking about not just the United States, this is international travel. How do you do this? There are lots of global regulations going into place, and 2017 is a big year where there are supposed to be, everybody's supposed to go into the same guidelines. But the problem has been is that nobody's found the magic bullet of how to make the ballast water safe. And that's because it costs a lot. Um, we're dealing with so many different species. We're doing everything from bacteria and viruses to fish. Um, so what works on one might not work on the other. And um, a lot of ships are going to have to be retrofitted. And I don't think very many people actually want to do that right. part. So the cost, I would think the enforcement would be difficult too. And when you have multiple countries and that involved, that must be a difficult thing to regulate. Why do you think there's such an attraction for people to have um, a unique plant or an animal that, that's not native? Um, a lot of people want to have a memory. So one of the first known invasive species was brought over from England. Somebody, you know, a few years after the pilgrims came, they put a snail in their pocket. And this is in what, the 1700s or so? And they released it when they got here. Now most of New England is this specific snail. So people want memories, treasures. I, mean, I don't know, a photograph might be easier. But if you saw lionfish when you were in the Indo-Pacific, on your honeymoon, maybe you want to always have a memory of that honeymoon. Not of a lionfish. <laughs> a lionfish might be a little extreme, but um, very common. Or you know, some of the clownfish, the Nemo fish, things like that. People just want to see them. They think they're pretty. And not thinking probably 
the, the potential of the damage. Or thinking that they won't be the problem. I mean, oh, I don't okay. think people, I mean, a lot of releases, especially from the aquarium and pet trade, are um, accidental releases. They aren't going to say, I'm trying to kill Florida. Or um, they, they just can't keep it for some reason. Yes. Or other. Now, you mentioned the lionfish. What are some of the common invasive species, plant and animal, that we already have here in the state? Oh, we have so many. I, as you said earlier, Burmese python. They are having the, the hunt going on in the Everglades right python now. Python challenge, that's right. Yep. Um, there are a number of kinds of seaweeds and things that most people don't think about. And that's my, my research has been on a lot of um, different types of seaweeds that you don't buy um, at the aquarium shop, but they come along, they just hand you some. And a lot of those, so there isn't even any records of them being transported from person to person. And we've documented in our lab that a lot of these species of seaweed, which are called feather algae or spaghetti algae, if you have just one living cell, which is microscopic in size, you can create a whole new individual from that. It'll just keep growing from that one cell. And even if you're straining your water or doing some of the things that are recommended, unless you're straining it fine enough, you can be um, transferring some of these organisms. So a lot of the things that have happened have been so inadvertent, and now we still are seeing the consequences. With the research that you've conducted in Florida, and you've been here a number of years, are you seeing a change in the type or incidence of invasive species over the last decade or so? There are more and more. Uh, there are a lot of marine species that we now find on oyster reefs, and I do a lot of oyster research. And we just published a paper on three different invasive species that came in since the year 2000, and two of them are mussels, one of them's a barnacle, and all three would be considered invasive because they had negative impacts on the oysters. They just weren't there when I started doing my research, and they're obvious. I mean, the barnacle is bright pink. One of the mussels is bright green. So, so that fast, it can turn around and yes. invade an environment. And once they enter a new environment, there's usually some period of time before they really take over. And it's usually for anywhere from you know, five to 20 years. So you'll see kind of a bloom and then you'll see none and you think, okay, well, it's all gone. Then they're back and kind of back and forth. So we're trying to prepare for when some of these species really do become dominant. Well, you mentioned the, the cycles that go through with Florida, with our climate, and then with the geography of the state, are we, a more desirable habitat for thriving invasive species? Oh, we are the perfect habitat. <laughs> I mean, a lot of people come to Florida because it's so nice. I was hoping a, you wouldn't say that. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of organisms come because we don't get too cold, so a lot of tropical, subtropical species can survive in Florida. Do the different states, and I don't know if this is the case or not, do different states have different rules or border crossings? How, do we, yes, how um, do we fit in with that? Every state and has to abide by whatever the federal regulations are for invasive species, but there aren't, there aren't too many. Um, states like California are much more proactive than Florida is. And in part, um, that is because they've had to spend you know, millions and millions of dollars on some specific invaders. And one of them just happens to be a seaweed. They spent $6 million to eradicate one type of seaweed. And so you are not allowed to have that genus. You know, any related type of that seaweed in the state, whereas we're allowed to have it in Florida. So possibly legislative action or even making our legislators aware of, of yeah. some of the need to have uh, of restrictions might be a way to go in the future. Now you talk about economic impact. Can you, can you tell us a little bit more about how, how that affects us? Obviously it's taxpayers, but um, the initial way that a lot of uh, marine species are found is because they start clogging um, intake pipes for electric plants or water generating plants, and all of a sudden there's no water, there's no power, and so you know the millions what's of dollars. What's the, the algae or what, what's? It could be anything. Um, a lot of times it is barnacles or mussels or things like that, things that we aren't paying attention to. Mm. So a lot of them are considered cryptic just because they're. You know, they aren't obvious. They aren't like a Burmese python. But they get in there and they can be incredibly destructive. Um, tourism industry can take a major shift. Um, with lionfish, I think they've done okay because you're allowed to harvest as many lionfish as you want. Although I think that those have been growing so fast in population, has that even helped? Yeah, not a lot, but it's kept some tourism going. Okay. If you were going to, you know, your magic coral reef 
and in the Florida Keys and all of a sudden it's just a reef full of lionfish, you may decide to go somewhere else until they tell you you can spear the lionfish and eat them for dinner. So, I mean, there is a I bit I don't of, want to do that. They're actually really good. Are they? Oh my goodness, they <laughs> well, are really good. Well, maybe that will encourage people to kill more of them. But they're, they're hard to get the fillets off, I, yeah. I will say that. Yeah. What would be your recommendation then for reducing the risk of bringing in new invasive species to the state? We need a combination of both government regulation, and we're, we're slowly getting there with that, but we also need people to have awareness. So we need the outreach, we need the education, and there's a lot being done in little pockets. Um, like my lab has created children's books for preschoolers on marine invasive species. And you know we've probably given out free 10,000 copies of each of the book. What a wonderful that, idea. It is, it is it's a wonderful yes. book. Um, and we had, you know, we had educators write it, so we, we had everything so it's age appropriate and language appropriate. But even if we've given out 20,000 copies of books, that's only hitting maybe 40,000 people, and there are a lot more people who need to know about this. California is much better with just having like TV commercials and things like that, um, and they've gotta be ongoing. So something like the aquarium industry, you'll get into it one day, and you know, you, maybe you'll stop two years later, but somebody else is getting into it when you're stopping. So if you only do it at one point in time, you hit one group, but not the next right, group. Right, the continuity. So I think public information of how yeah, problematic they are is about the best thing we can do. Well, hopefully the show will help a little bit. Thank you so much, and, and I wish you the best with your research. Thank you. When we come back, we'll discuss the state's efforts to control the damage caused by invasive species and how the public can help. Our next guest is Sarah Funk, a non-native fish and wildlife program coordinator at the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission. Sarah, welcome to the show. Hi, thanks for having me. Your website has an enormous amount of information on non-native mm -hmm. species of animals here in Florida. Is this a new problem or something that's been around for a while? This is something that's been around for a while in the state of Florida. Um, we have certain exotic species that have been here since the 1800s. Um, it, for example, the brown anole has been here since like 1887, I believe. And then we have some different kinds of species that are more recent introductions, like the Argentine black and white tegu. Is it more of a problem now? I don't know that it's necessarily more of a problem now. It's um, something that we've certainly become more aware of as a scientific community that invasive species can definitely impart threats to natural resources. So it's definitely um, more up and coming as part of the scientific community. Do you think that because we travel more globally and on the internet that you can find and buy anything that you want, does this contribute to having more non-native species brought into the state? Yes, yeah, certainly. Um, basically, the, the global kind of community that exists now um, definitely allows for the important introduction of species all over the world, not just here in Florida. And Florida definitely has major zones of import as well, so there, that's certainly a source of introduction or a potential source of introduction. Sarah, how do, how do these animals come into the state then? There's a variety of ways, so some can be introduced intentionally. Um, for example, there are certain um, agricultural pests uh, that we needed to combat in the past, and so some species were released intentionally to try to control those. Um, we've also had accidental introductions. We've had um, unwanted pets that have been released into the wild. So there's, there's a variety of ways that they can get to the state. What do you think is the most uh, pressing environmental threat right now with a non-native species that we already have in the state? Well, within our section, the wildlife impact section within FWC, we work primarily with um, a lot of exotic reptiles. We work with the Burmese python, Nile monitors, uh, tegus, which are really large lizards, as well as a variety of exotic freshwater fish species, and we even delve a little bit into marine fish as well, so we also work with the lionfish. Do you think one in particular is, is the biggest threat? 
I think it depends who you talk to and what natural resource um, is important to a certain stakeholder. So it can, it can vary between individual. Why is it so important when a problematic species is identified that you remove it from public lands? So the FWC, um, one of our primary missions is to maintain natural resources for the benefit of the people of the state of Florida. And so protecting our public lands definitely aligns with the mission of our agency. And if invasive species can impart some kind of adverse impacts to our natural resources, then by all means we want to take care of that problem. Do you cover private property? We try to work with private landowners. Um, private landowners can remove exotic species from properties at any time throughout the year. As long as they have landowner permission, they do it within legal and humane methods as well. I would think that it might be difficult if you can't cover the private property. Um, there's not a recognition from a, a, a species of animals that could know when mm -hmm. property boundaries are yeah, private. Yes, certainly. Or yep, absolutely. They don't recognize the boundaries that we do, so it's really important to develop positive working relationships with all of our partners, whether they be NGOs, private landowners, um, universities, et cetera. NGOs, would you explain what that is? Uh, Non-governmental non right, organization. Right. Mm -hmm. What's the biggest challenge does your, that your department has in managing non-native species? I think one of the biggest problems that we have is the elusiveness of some of these species. They're just so hard to find. Uh, for example, the Burmese python has a detection rate that's less than 1%. So just trying to find them once they're here becomes really challenging. Uh, in addition to that, determining what the next risk might be, determining what the next invasive species might be is, is also a challenge. Is our environment more conducive, would you say, to non-native species thriving than in other areas? It certainly can be considered uh, conducive to harboring certain invasive species. Uh, the climate matches a lot of tropical and subtropical areas where some of these invasive species can come from. Uh, there's plenty of freshwater habitat. There's all kinds of places for them to hide. We have a lot of uh, preserved lands where these species can hide and where they can thrive as well. Sarah, what happens then? Take us through the procedure when you get a call from a private citizen mm -hmm. that they've possibly spotted something they're sure. not sure or want you to check out, what do you do? So we first want to confirm the identification of the species. So whoever is reporting that species, we ask that they try to take a photograph. Um, of course, doing so as safely as possible and then submit it to us so we can get a positive confirmation on the ID. We also want to note the exact location of the species. So if someone can obtain like GPS coordinates or even an intersection where they've seen something, that's really helpful as well. So we know exactly where the species was last seen. And from there, we can determine if the species is indeed an invasive and if it warrants some kind of response. So we have a network of partners who are trained that can help us with this response. Um, they're throughout the state, primarily our section or our program works out of South Florida, but we have partners from all different um, agencies and organizations that can help respond if needed. Do you have different categories or levels of non-native species? Sure, so what it means for something to be non-native or exotic is that historically it's not from an area. So in Florida, it's not from Florida or it's not from South Florida, depending on the situation. Once that species is here in the state, it's considered introduced. And if it continues to stay introduced and starts a breeding colony that's established for several years, we consider that an established exotic. Um, if the species can impart some kind of adverse or harmful impact to the environment, to the economy, or to human health, then we consider it an invasive species. So when you get one of these calls, if you, if you find that it's identified as one of the problematic species, what steps do you take then? Well, we can remove it if needed. Um, we oftentimes try to determine what the best response is depending on the situation, depending on the species. If it's something that's typically not seen in an area, for example, if we see a python up in the northern part of Florida. Um, typically, we don't see those there. We don't know of any breeding populations in northern Florida. We would certainly want to respond to that and remove it as quickly as possible. So how does the commission go about stopping or even halting damage when uh, an, an invasive species has been identified as, as a big problem? Well, the best thing that the agency can do and what we strive to do is to prevent these issues from happening through education and awareness through outreach programs as well. Um, there's also some regula uh, regulation in place for the import and trade of these species, both within the state, federally, and abroad. 
and um, if needed, we can we can go out and we can remove something. So, what other organizations um, do you work with? Do you partner with anyone? Yeah, we have a lot of really positive partnerships: um, NGOs, universities, tribes. Um, private landowners, all kinds of great partnerships, and they're really essential to making these programs work because we need to all be on the same page. And we strive to align our goals and even our methods for dealing with invasive species so that we can impart the most effective management plan. Now you talked about introducing sometimes non-native species for beneficial purposes. Do industries come with you or agriculture confer with you? Do you work with people in that capacity? To some degree, um, FWC doesn't really deal with that specifically. I feel like that might be more something that, um, for example, FDAX or the Florida Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services might deal with. Um, that's definitely been done in the past, but FWC doesn't typically release anything. Sarah, do you think that we're seeing more then uh, of non-native species? Are you identifying any more um, as our population has grown? Does anything change in, in, in that respect? We see new things every day. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean that it's gonna become established. Um, if it's something really unique or something that warrants a response, we'll go out and we'll remove that individual or pair or whatever it happens to be. But um, like I said before, trying to predict what could be the next really problematic invasive species is a big challenge. Now you mentioned um, public education. Are there programs out there to help educate the, pro the, the, the public? Your website is, is fabulous. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the website for sure, myfwc.com, is one place we uh, anyone can visit and learn about all kinds of different exotic species that are here in Florida. Um, we also try to attend as many festivals and outreach seminars and things like that as we can. We also have training programs in place for safe capture of pythons and also for rep exotic reptile identification, and that's through our python removal permit program. So people can learn how to go out in the field and if they do come across a python, what to do and how to record it and uh, submit all that information appropriately. Um, we have all kinds of freshwater fish removal days and awareness days. Um, we're constantly hosting festivals and yeah, we have everything from pamphlets and brochures to children's books and um, Probably one of the most exciting things we do as well is the exotic pet amnesty program. So if somebody has a, an exotic pet, in other words, not a dog or a cat, and they can't take care of it anymore for whatever reason, um, we allow those folks to bring it to one of these events or call our hotline and surrender that animal to us and then we'll do our best to find it a new home as long as it's in good, healthy condition. So you can call the 1-88-I've-got-1 hotline. That's one way to get involved in their amnesty program or to report any invasive sighting. You can go to the website which has the same name, I've got one.org, or there's also a downloadable app now. So you can actually use your your smartphone to report invasive species sightings. Uh, everything's user friendly. Mm -hmm. How can the public help you? I think probably the best way that the public can help us is to remember the don't let it loose message. We have this no questions asked amnesty program. So if someone surrenders an exotic pet to us, there are no penalties and we do our best to find that animal a new home. So we have pre-registered adopters for specific kinds of animals that will come to these events and will adopt them same day. You can always report species sightings to the hotline, 188-I've-got-1. Uh, also the website, the downloadable app. You can attend all these festivals that we host um, and learn about invasive species and what you can do to help as well. Um, there's also simple things you can do. You know, a lot of folks don't realize that some introductions are accidental. So for example, um, if you have a boat, you can just clean your boat after every use. You can remember not to just discharge your ballast water in areas, you know, when you change water bodies. Um, all of those things are really simple actions that the public can take to uh, help combat the spread of invasive species. And keep our state great. That's right. Thank you so much. You're quite welcome. That's all the time we have today. Thank you for joining us on Metro Center Outlook. Until next time, I'm Diane Trees.